We are talking about the death of Charlemagne in 843 and how his three grandsons inherited the empire. The empire was divided among three grandsons. One part went to the elder one, which is today the state of Germany, the country of Germany. The second one <coughs> uh, went to son that includes France, mainly France, Belgium and Netherlands. The third one is basically the kingdom of Italy and the Middle Kingdoms. These three grandsons could not really protect the kingdom because people from the Scandinavian countries and Hungary, they were continuously attacking these people and they didn't have the uh, strength to withstand the attack. So they themselves finally, in order to save their kingdom, they have done an arrangement. They divided the uh, land with all the properties and everything you know, uh, to different princes whom they considered were very strong. They knew that without the support of these princes they could not go any further. So they gave them, they called them technically vassals because they are the landholders now. And these vassals themselves could not, you know, keep the land, therefore they gave them to fiefs sub land loans and they gave it to the bishops, archbishops and uh, abbots that is leaders of monasteries and also to uh, you know big farmers. So the land became in the hand of a few people. You know, that's feudalism. Land is held by a uh, few people. Others are all just uh, you know tenants who are cultivating the land and they have to give a portion of the yield to these landlords and keep the rest. So this system basically continued in Europe until Reformation. It's only after Reformation the feudalism has, uh, has gone and there was a reason for it. The political result of feudalism was a decentralization. Instead of one man ruling the country, now there are a number of people who are ruling. Every country was broken up into a large number of small principalities ruled by these nobles. These nobles held the power of a king, each in his own domain. The king was only the chief noble. Sometimes a number of nobles would be united to fight against the king. <laughs> You know, this sort of thing always went on, but more often they would fight among themselves, each other, because they wanted to annex more land that belongs to the other uh, prince, that way he will become a bigger prince. But sometimes, if the king will bring in any uh, rule that they thought was against the interest of these feudals, then they will unite and they will fight against the king, and king usually then yield and change. <laughs> uh, the Norsemen, that is the people from uh, the Netherlands and, uh, and all those places, uh, they came and they attacked, you know, these landlords. They did not go back to Norway and Denmark, these places from where they came. Instead they settled in France. Those who settled down in northwestern France were called the Normans. And uh, those who settled down in other places in France were no, called Normandies. So two group of people basically became dominant in France, the Normans and the Normandies. <coughs> now interestingly, the Normans and Normandies, they set out on their own for further expedition. William Duke of Normandy in, uh, invaded Europe, so invaded England in 1066 and defeated it. So the Normans conquered the whole southern Italy. And now the feudal lords, <coughs> they either supported the Pope, they wanted always the Pope they like. 
The Pope cannot operate without the feudal lords because the emperor is gone. Emperor is not that powerful uh, unless, uh, you know, occasionally a very powerful king will come, emperor will come like Charlemagne. But more often these feudals were uh, having control even over the king. So the Italian feudals, has a, you know, those feudal lords controlled the Pope. Whichever noble family got control of Rome will dictate conditions for peace to Pope. Pope had to agree. He will put his own Pope in, you know, in Rome. Popes were replaced frequently by the landlords. After all, it was, uh, you know, these landlords who controlled the Popes. Between 891 and 955, 20 Popes existed. So you can just see how frequently they changed. One Pope come and, you know, some of them are a little stronger, so they won't listen to these landlords. They will all unite together and then withdraw all the financial support and everything and even threaten war. So the Pope has to listen to them. So these Popes changed because of the death of the Popes? Or? No, no, they were removed. They were removed. They were removed. See the... The, these feudal landlords basically have the majority of the bishops or the cardinals under them. So they will call a council and they will make a resolution, again, pass a resolution against this pope and dethrone him. They will nominate another one and appoint him. <laughs> That's the sort of thing. Of course, in between some of them died also. So very soon what happened Popes began to look to Germany for help. Popes sought the friendship of Otto, who actually rescued the Pope. Otto was a strong man. You know, Pope made him the next emperor on February 2nd, 962. The Western Emperor was rescued by uh, Otto uh, from the hands of the attackers. And Otto <coughs> aided John uh, the 12th to become the Pope. Now the problem came. The Germans are supporting the Pope, but the Pope's headquarters is in Italy, in Rome. <laughs> so the Italians did not like the fact that Germans have control over their Pope. So the Italians basically, you know, they threatened the Pope. You know, so there were times when Pope had real problem. Now the Italian tradition of popes was broken. Otto III placed his tutor, a Gerbert, who was an archbishop, as pope in 19, uh, 999. He was the first French pope. All the popes of this time were from Italy. After him, Gregory II, a German, came as pope. So popes began to come from France, Germany, and other European countries. So this was a major shift. You know, until 999, not single Pope ever came from any place other than Italy. But now Popes begin to come from other places. Another major development happened, that is, the Popes began to sell their office <laughs> for money to other people. The Tuscan family, you know, the lords who controlled Rome, made Benedict IX as Pope in 1033. He was only 12 years old at that time. You think of that, a 12-year-old boy was made Pope. And he turned to be one of the worst Popes in history. You can just imagine that a 12-year-old boy becoming the head of the, you know, the church. That's terrible. He was so corrupt that a Crescentio family, that's another Lord family, who were enemies of the Tuscan family, drove out this Pope in 1045 out of Rome. He ran from Italy for his life. After some time, Benedict got tired of, you know, popery, and uh, he said, I'm tired of this one. I wanted to sell it. So he sold it for 1,000 pounds of silver to a man who later became Gregory VI. <laughs> the system of buying or selling office, ecclesiastical office, is called simony. You know how simony originated. In the book of Acts, there was a Simon who came 
and to Peter with money and said that they give me this power. So that's the name Simony. So Simony became a very popular terminology in you know in the ecclesiastical history. There were people who will be selling. Even the Pope himself will sell. Said, "Give me so much money, I'm tired of." You know. <laughs> Because of all the fights between the warlords and all these people, you know, popes were frequently under the threat. So some of them became a little weak and they found somebody and said, Hey, you want to take popery over? You give me so much money. I sell it. This shameful conduct of Benedict was leaked out and people made a great hue and cry. Because, you know, these things were usually done in private but uh, this thing you know that benedict has sold his uh, papacy to uh, gregory the sixth became a you know public common song and therefore people were very ha angry so benedict what happened he sold it and took the money but when the people became against him he refused to give the <laughs> the throne <laughs> you know he said no I didn't sell anybody I didn't take anybody's money you know <laughs> so I'm going to continue to be the Pope so then you can just uh, imagine that, that what will happen hmm? so there are three Popes at that time you know there was Sylvester the third Benedict the ninth and Gregory the sixth there are three <laughs> the Tuscan family has made Benedict the ninth as Pope and then the Crescentine family who were against them, they drew out him and made Sylvester the third Pope. And now <coughs> Benedict has sold his, you know, papacy to Gregory the sixth. And uh, Benedict is still occupying the throne, the other two are fighting, you know. <laughs> so three Popes. That's very sad history, you know, this is <coughs> how sad it is. And Catholics and Protestants are descendants of this kind of Christianity. Because at this time there is no division of Protestants or Catholic. That came uh, much after. You know, Luther came, you know, in the, in the early in the 1500s. So we are only in the thousands now. So this is the kind of what you call the legacy that many of the Christian denominations have inherited. You know, the fight for authority, love for money and all kinds of things <clears throat> a thing to be so shameful about but yet it was happening so this is the time as last week I said the church was going to be divided you know Europe in the thousands uh, was very strange because the Roman Empire died but the church survived and the church was growing church made Gains in Northern Europe because of uh, missionary activity. But the church lost a good area to the Muslims. That was also there. 1000 AD church is found in Italy, France, Netherlands, England, Germany, Austria, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Ireland, Scotland and Russia. So in a lot, that's all Western uh, Germany. The, the mission activity was basically done by the, the Western church. Eastern they did not do very much. They didn't have any war, they didn't have any such internal problems, you know. The uh, emperor there was very strong. So the Roman uh, rulership was continuing in the eastern part of the Roman Empire while the western part completely collapsed. Italy was now occupied by Germans. Very interestingly, Italy, the Germans were barbarians they were attacking you know they were attacking Italy Western Europe and they have come now they have accepted Christianity so they are Christians but they are culturally they are barbarians <coughs> and they intermarried with Italians uh, but the you know it's a mixed race therefore the old Roman stock continued but yet new blood you will say that the purity of the Italians Italians to a great extent is lost in Gaul, it was occupied by Germans and mixed with the Romanized Celts and Romans. Control was in the hands of Franks, a German tribe. In Netherlands, the people were Franks in the south and Saxons in the east. Frisians in the northwest, all 
ജർമാനിക്കൻ ഒറിജിൻ ദ വെർ ഓൾ ജർമാനിക്കൻ ഒറിജിൻ ഡിഫറെൻറ്റ് പീപ്പിൾ ഇൻ ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് വെൻ ദ റോമൻസ് ലെഫ്റ്റ് ജർമൻസ് ആൻഡ് സാക്സൺസ് ഇൻ ഓ കണ്ടിന്യൂഡ് അണ്ടർ റോമൻ ഓക്കുപേഷൻ ദിസ് വാസ് കോൾഡ് ബ്രിട്ടാണിയ നൗ ഇറ്റ് കെയിം ടു ബി കോൾഡ് ഇംഗ്ലണ്ട് ആഫ്റ്റർ ദി യു നോ ദി ആംഗ്ലസ് ഫ്രം വിച്ച് ദി ആംഗ്ലിക്കൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ഓൾ യു നോ എക്സ്പ്രഷൻസ് കം ജർമ്മനി ഓസ്ട്രിയ ഡെൻമാർക്ക് നോർവേ സ്വീഡൻ വെർ നെവർ പാർട്ട് ഓഫ് ദ റോമൻ എംപയർ ദി പോപ്പുലേഷൻ ഓഫ് ദീസ് കൺട്രീസ് വെർ ബട്ട് ജർമാനിക് ഐർലൻഡ് ആൻഡ് സ്കോട്ട്ലൻഡ് നെവർ ബിലോങ് ടു റോമൻ എംപയർ ദേ വർ കൺവേർട്ട് ബൈ മിഷൻ വർക്ക് ഓൺലി ദ ഇൻഹാബിറ്റൻസ് ഓഫ് ദീസ് കൺട്രീസ് വെർ നോൺ ജർമാനിക് ദ ആർ കോൾഡ് ദി ഐർലൻഡ് പീപ്പിൾ ആർ കോൾഡ് സെൽറ്റ്സ് ആൻഡ് സ്കോട്ട്ലൻഡ് പീപ്പിൾ ആർ കോൾഡ് പി ഐ സി ടി എസ് പിക്സ് റഷ്യ വാസ് ക്രിസ്റ്റനൈസ് ബൈ മിഷണറീസ് ഫ്രം കോൺസ്റ്റാൻറ്റിനോപ്പിൾ ഹു എസ്റ്റാബ്ലിഷ് ദ ഗ്രീക്ക് ഓർത്തഡോക്സ് ചർച്ച് ദ ഈസ്റ്റേൺ പാർട്ട് എംപയർ ബേസിക്കലി ഈസ് എ ഗ്രീക്ക് in the western part the language was latin so church was slowly getting divided into latin church and greek church that was uh, you know the, the separate order of worship and everything so the church in the west was predominantly germanic the german tribes were barbarians and had no civilization however by coming to the church you know it passed to them the latin language literature and civilization so these barbarians are now getting you know civilized yeah that's good christianity at least has done that much good for them so for this reason the western churches though germanic in people you know they were now called a latin because the italians gave them the culture and the language which they adopted these people were not educated they could not read and write you know <coughs> pepin we talked last week that how even though he was a very powerful king he did not know he, you know he could not sign his name he has to put the thumb impression but they were very mighty people you know they were not people without uh, you know common sense but they didn't have knowledge you know that was what was lacking so the church in the eastern church uh, the greek orthodox tradition and the western church the latin church the roman church you know you can just see that polarization was slowly taking place culturally they were different people were different linguistically they were different in the order of worship that was different what they call the order of worship in malayalam it is called a rit you know an order of worship you know <coughs> yeah. so you know the 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 roman empire the western empire gone the eastern empire still there but the church is taking different shape last week i shared about a number of issues between the uh, between the east and the west and you probably remember about them you know about marriage and celibacy about having nuns in the churches the eastern churches objected to it the western church required it then growing beard as supposed to clean shaven having uh, the girdles on their robes and the caps and not no caps the eucharistic controversy of using you know uh, leavened bread or no leavened you know there were many and also the the coming of the holy spirit you know through father or through father and son you know a number of these controversies were rocking the the churches and and everybody knew that this won't go as one church to this time the churches were known as only by the city like the church at alexandria the church at uh, you know uh, rome or the church at uh, constantinople the patriarch or the bishop of these cities basically controlled everything so the church was known as there were no catholic church there no roman catholic church there were no orthodox church denominationalism was not there but yet now it almost became inevitable that the churches cannot continue to go you know uh, as a united body because the differences became so strong so we have in the beginning of the middle ages a church in europe with the latin language and literature Uh, but people mainly germanic race in the eastern roman empire the situation was totally different 
the embrace did not fall under the attack of the German barbarians. For another thousand years, the empire lasted. However, the empire lost a lot of territory to the Muslims. Syria was gone, Palestine was gone, Egypt was gone. You know, a lot of territory was lost to the Muslims. In these countries, church totally collapsed. And interestingly, or sadly, these were the places where, you know, the seven churches of the Asia Minor, you know, in the book of Revelation were there. You think of that. They were the churches where Professor Paul has raised up some good churches like Ephesus, you know, and some of those churches. They were all gone. They were under the Muslims. There was not a trace of Christianity there. But in the rest of the empire, the church remained intact. The language of the church, of course, in the East was Greek. Now we have come to a crisis in church history. Until now, there was only one church with two languages for worship. But now the unity of the church is threatened. 1054, the division of the church came. 1054, the church was finally divided. The Greek eastern part and the Latin western part. They are separated one from the other. Uh, this sent a separate... Uh, uh, this sort of a separation was not unforeseen or unpredicted. Many points of differences arose. In the early uh, part of the church history, such differences were settled, you know. Serious issues came, like uh, Mundanism came, you know, Eutychianism came, Arianism came, Siberianism came, and so many serious doctrinal problems came. And none of those problems divided the church because the king will call for a, you know, a synod and they will come together and they will study the Bible and they will finally come to a conclusion. But now uh, there is nobody like that to settle this problem. Actually some of the kings and nobles they tried very, mu very much. But there were some undercurrents, you know, there were some undercurrents. They were not doctrinal reasons, it's true. They were using, you know, doctrine as, a, as a, to save their face. Underneath was a power struggle, basically, power struggle. You know, the Eastern Patriarchs were jealous of the, the Pope because Pope had the whole Western, you know, country and the bishops under his control. So that means he had a legion of hundreds and thousands of bishops. So the Eastern, it's not like that. They're all separate, you know. <clears throat> the Antiochian Patriarch, the Constantinople Patriarch, the Russian Patriarch, uh, and uh, you know they have patriarch in every major city and so one patriarch had only maybe 50 or 60 churches under him <laughs> uh, while the Roman Pope had a lot more money and a lot more power and this really made the Eastern uh, patriarchs very unhappy so you know they didn't want to go together because the Pope will always have more say on any issue if a, uh, you know, synod is called, the western bishops will be outnumbering the eastern. So the resolutions will be in their favor. So a separation was, a division was inevitable. Because these patriarchs also have to, you know, survive. So it was a foreseen and a predicted uh, separation. <coughs> the differences there, they were talking about these differences, but Everybody knew that, you know, <coughs> undercurrents were very, very strong. How to reveal the differences really? They were not that wrong, strong. The difference in the character of the West and the East were not revealed. The Eastern Church was more Oriental in character. And now that's a major division. The Oriental Churches always were, sorry, the Eastern uh, churches were more oriental, means mysticism was very much there. There were very little mysticism in the West. The oriental churches, the orient, orientalism as a whole is, you know, all oriental religions are mystic religions. And therefore the orient, the eastern part of the, the, the church, eastern bishops, they were more mystics. They were mysticism. Of course mysticism is nice in some ways because there is more bhakti, the so-called bhakti, but true or not is different. In the western uh, empire there was no bhakti. It was money. 
hate was power <laughs> you know hate was feudalism but east then they all talked about you know the mystics and the more you know that sort of thing uh, so this again became an issue in a sense because mystic mysticism interpreted the scriptures differently from the western church the western church interpreted the bible more literally the eastern church interpreted the church interpreted the bible more mystically so they assigned meanings that were or that could be seen only by <laughs> these mystics you know for everything there was special meaning so their point <coughs> their point of view on many issues was totally different when the empire was divided into two west and east more for administrative purposes the division finally you know implanted uh, a east and a west thinking differences in the west papacy became very strong and well established pope decided to have control over the eastern churches also this is what triggered you know pope was not satisfied happy just having the western churches under him he slowly wanted to infiltrate to the different churches in the east and slowly established and this was regretted and resented you know very highly resented by the patriarchs of constantinople and other because these people were taking away their territories <coughs> they did not like at all the idea that there is there are churches in their territory who are loyal to the pope than to them so the ill feeling was brewing for a long time and uh, you know it was looking for an opportunity to break away and i think the opportunity has come the break was inevitable the eastern church became <coughs> uh, uh eastern church because of peaceful atmosphere devoted more time to study the western church frequently there were you know barbarians of one group or other will be attacking and they were always you know under the burden of preserving their territory and the east never had that problem no war it was very much peace so those people devoted for you know bible study and all as a result the west did not produce any theologians but the east produced a lot of theologians some of the great one clement of alexandria athanasius origen john of damascus you know <coughs> and uh, many of these people great names came from from the east the founder of knowledge has summed up uh, summed up in the systematic and uh, comprehensive way in the whole development of theology in the east so eastern churches were more theological in outlook western churches were more materialistic in outlook more right to say that the western churches were liturgical while the eastern churches were theological and mystical so that's a, a major major difference between the east and the west and uh, it was at this time that uh, the great work of john you know john of damascus a great work he has made and it was translated into latin so that the western churches could read it and thus the western churches begin to be influenced theologically by the eastern churches while the western churches begin to capture the territory of the eastern churches by you know uh, approaching people and uh, giving them some things some money and some position so that the loyalty will be shifted there so the war you know really was going on in in two levels the eastern church was getting stagnant with old people old thinking and old customs but the western church was getting fresh blood because the western church was doing a lot of missionary work the eastern church didn't have no time for mission work they were producing professors and scholars but not you know missionaries so that also made when a church how theologically oriented when the same people come you know you have the same uh, way of thinking and same way of living then people get tired so there's no fresh blood this is a lesson we all have to how well we teach without new people coming into our churches we cannot survive after a while stagnation will come 
So it is inevitable that, you know, church should have. You show any church where, you know, for many years the same families are meeting, that church is in stagnation. That church cannot survive. Today or tomorrow it has to, you know, close up because, you know, it is not a conversions happening. It is only what you call the biological birth. The children and grandchildren continue. Children and grandchildren, they have no convictions. They only have the conveniences of the family. You ask the grandson, why are you in this church? Say that, well, my father and grandfather was there. You know, they have not made any choice in their life. But the new believers always have commitment because they have left something to grab it. They were taught something, therefore there is commitment and, you know, and that one. So, new believers must be there, must be there. Vibrancy is always for a uh, new church. This is the reason why new movements and new denominations are more powerful. People are more excited there. You take any. The latest movement, for example, the charismatic movement, there is great excitement there. You know, charismatic, this is a new movement. After someday what happened, they will lose there. So somebody else has to come out from them. And this is the sort of thing that going on. So the Eastern churches were getting stagnant with old people, old thinking and old customs. But the West was totally different. Though theologically they were not well formulated, the new Germanic blood brought, brought to the church a new fervor and life. In the East is a stagnant pool, the West is a militant sea. That's what one author said. You can always see new waves coming in the sea. But in the pool, the water is calm, but it's stagnant. You know, of course you have the comforts. The missionary works, these, uh, the Western churches yeah. did. Was it, did they convert real? Uh, or, or it was... Uh, but they were making people Christians. You know, it's very difficult to say how much gospel they preached. <laughs> Uh, but they will go and uh, give them all, give them all baptism and uh, you know, uh, they make them to for, forsake their gods and goddesses and all that. They will as accept Jesus Christ and the saints of the, you know, the Roman Catholic, the, the Roman Church, not the Catholic, the Catholic Church, not the Roman Church. You know, whatever system of worship and all they had, that they will be. So they will claim that we are now Christians, we are pagans but now Christians. We used to worship such and such gods and goddesses, but now we worship Jesus Christ or, you know, Mary or who were doing. So they were Christians. So they are, their culture was different now. They were cultured and cultured people. So this sort of uh, the East-West struggle was going on. Uh, the Western Church, of course, as I said, uh, you know, though some new blood was coming, and the evils were more in the Western Church. The Simony was only in the Western Church, for example. And also, moral problems was in the Western Church. The Western Church was getting rich. So they had all the conveniences, modern conveniences. So Church of the Middle Ages is totally different from the Church of the Apostolic Era. You cannot have any comparison. You know, the believers were totally different. Are they born again? Do they ever use that phrase? You know, this sort of. But conversion was taking place, the whole people were converted, you know. And sin was rampant. Simony became normal. Many people were sick and tired of sinful ways of the churches. But what is the solution? What is the solution? Bishops and popes and priests were living like kings. And, uh, you know, the rich were enjoying life like anything. If there was any morality, it may be restricted to the poor people, you know, <laughs> because they did not have many avenues of uh, that sort of luxury, sinful way of living. So the average poor people wanted a way out, somehow. But what is the way out? Finally, they found a way out that is called asceticism, you know. It is the extreme self-denial. People turned uh, to spiritual meditation, forsaking normal life in the society. They will go away, leaving the society, forsaking marriage and everything. They will go to monasteries and they will stay there, you know, eat very little and they will be s spending their time all in meditation and study 
and that sort of thing. You know. It's happened, it's happened in the Western Church, yes. Yeah, the Eastern judges, uh, as I said, the mystical and all that studies and all that, they were, they were cold and traditional, nothing. But however, the immorality factor was not major there. Immorality factor was not, because the Eastern judges, the priests were marrying and everything, you know. So there was family life and all. Western judges, the marriage was not permitted and so there were more rooms for that sort of thing. So the Western judge, those who were tired of the, the, uh, the, f the fleshly appetite of the people and the wrong way of life of the leadership, they, have it, they, they turned it to, you know, asceticism. Yes. <coughs> In the West, a cloister life was developed, cloister life, you know, that is a number of ascetics living together under one roof. So they call them clo cloister life. In, that's called more called the monastics. I mean, all the monks, monks and the nuns abstained from marriage and they devoted their time for prayer, reading and meditation. So collectively they were doing. Well, in a sense that was good, you may say that, because, you know, on one side of this uh, worldliness was, uh, you know, uh, growing and, uh, and nobody could control it and... Uh, Bishops and priests and Pope and even and all the landlords and all the rich people, they were having just fun. They were just having fun. And uh, those who, you know, had some fear of God in their heart, they were so upset with this. So what's the solution? So they turned it to monasticism. And the, and the cloister life came. And it's good that they devoted a lot of time for prayer and, you know, and study and meditation and all. Monasticism grew to monastic orders. Monastic order means union of a number of cloisters under one rule and common government. That's where the Augustinians, uh, the Jesuits, and uh, you know, you have uh, so many of those orders. So first they were all independent, you know, every monastery was independent. There may be 50 or 100 monks there and nuns there and uh, now they united, kind of a union. So they under one strong leader and, uh, you know, they have taken, you know, different, different names. You know, they have started such, uh, such a common government and common rule. There may be a head of, uh, of them. Some of them became very strong, you know, counter pope, you know. And the Jesuits, the leader of the Jesuits, one time was called the Black Pope, you know. I mean, he had, he had more, more priests under him showing allegiance to him than the Pope. So he could even almost threaten the Pope, you know. So some of these, uh, even now, some of them are, the uh, Jesuits are still very strong. I don't know which one is the most powerful uh, uh, of those orders, I don't know. The Augustinians closed down, Martin Luther and they were all Augustinians and so the Reformation in German was basically among the Augustinians and so they all came out. So in the West, the monks did much service uh, to the cause of civilization. When the barbarians waged attack in the West, the monasteries gave asylum to many people. The weary travelers found the monasteries as places of refuge and hospitals for the sick. So, you know, these people were doing a lot of charitable work and they were also doing a lot of educational work. So they were doing many good things, you know, as far as the, the profit, there are many good things. And they were also advancing ag agriculture. That was another thing. The monasteries eventually had large holdings of land, large holdings. So they have livestock and, you know, dairy farms and chicken farms and this and, and orchards and all these things. And so they were advancing and they were contributing to the common welfare of the society as a whole, they were teaching people, you know, different arts. So monasteries were not devoted only to prayer and some meditations. They were also involved in other other things. That was good. <coughs> yes, she started the Sisters of Charity. You know. So they were uh, basically, uh, you know, caring for the poor and the needy. You know. So different ones. Different ones have different emphasis. 
the jesuit saw i think uh, jesuit saw emphasis on education and uh, you know some of the best institutes in even india are you know operated by the jesuits and uh, there are different different forgotten so many different the uh, vincentians jesuits and this, there's so many so many you know <coughs> yeah there are there are many 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 good good institutions each one had a different uh different the kambuchians for example they are they are missions they are missionary people they give great emphasis for conversions and that sort of thing you know so every monastery monastic group have their own emphasis there are you know Uh, like some NGO organizations devoted to you know maybe digging wells and establishing uh, farmlands and all for the poor people there were some of these people who were doing that one and people were benefited it uh, the monasteries also advanced agriculture however monasticism was founded upon a false premise that was a problem hmm? it was a false premise those who chose for marriage family business or trade were considered inferior in morality while those who have forsaken marriage and uh, gone to mon- monasteries they were considered higher in morality which was a false concept you know actually you know <coughs> marriage was not for immoral people <laughs> it was you know <laughs> marriage was you know god ordained marriage for everybody actually to avoid morality marriage was therefore married people were less spiritual than unmarried people you know the the premise was wrong they were doing good things but the premise was wrong and when you start something on a wrong premise or foundation you know that it's bound to go wrong <coughs> the propagate they propagated the wrong theology that sinful heart is cleansed by withdrawing from the world that was their theology sinful heart is cleansed by withdrawing from the world see jesus christ taught us that we should be the salt and the light of the world hmm? it is not a light that is coming out from the celestial body you know no we have to live right among the people we have to show them we have to influence them but these people said no 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 you know you have to withdraw from them because the sinful passions you know will be flared up if you live in the among the people no he had walked with god and he had begat sons and daughters people godly people walking with you know god like uh, noah he walked with god and he had sons abraham walked with god and he had sons you know great great patriarchs and great great saints were all married and they lived family life actually family makes a person more holy you know that definitely is true you take the life of unmarried people you know before their marriage and after their marriage usually after their marriage they settle down you know they kind of mellow down a little bit you know the passions all go and their thinking even change and that's naturally so these people were advocating propagating the wrong theology you know wrong theology however as days went by what happened monasteries became centers of corruption they became centers of corruption many monks and nuns could not honor self imposed ascetic life monasticism became breeding ground for all kinds of wickedness yes today you know that the many many stories about that sort of uh, thing the church began to feel that it was enough for ordinary christians to observe certain outward ceremonies prescribed by the church they should learn the lord's prayer and the apostles creed that's enough they should confess their sins to the priest all should participate in the lord's supper which they believe to impart special grace the church said to all the ordinary people don't worry about it. don't worry about morality don't worry about ethics all that you have to is what you should learn the lord's prayer say it morning afternoon evening so many times and you also say the apostolic creed 
every Sunday in the church. And then you should confess your sins at least once a week. You know, if not necessarily once a week, at least, you know, they have certain days when you have to confess the sins and participate in the Lord's Supper. And, you know, this was theirs. So, <clears throat> the church shifted to what we call sacramental Christianity. That's the beginning of sacramental Christianity. There is no reality, it's sacramental. You know, you can live the way you want, but you go and confess it and then participate from the Eucharist, the Mass, and you say the Lord's Prayer. You're pretty good. You know, what you do in your business, you're cheating people, it doesn't matter. In the evening you make sure you say the Lord's Prayer before going to bed. You know, and on Sunday or whatever day you go to happen to go to church, you confess. So sacramental Christianity was, you know, has replaced the, the real Christianity. In the East, you know, of course sacraments there, but it is, uh, it's a different, it is the mystical. Anybody, anybody who wants to be godly is also a mystic. You know, you cannot be a mystic unless you read and study, you know, under some patriarchs and other mystic and all that. So they were producing theological books and, uh, you know, and different, different uh, mystical writings, while the West was basically justifying all the corruptions even found in the monasteries. But not everybody was happy. Even some in the monasteries were really upset with this. They could not take it any longer. You know, you can always find good people everywhere that have found that. Good people are in the Catholic Church, good people are in the Protestant Church. So you don't choose a church based upon where you can find good people. You have to choose a church based upon where you can find the right doctrine. <laughs> that you cannot find everywhere, you know. It's a doctrine and the life. They're like the two rail tracks. If the doctrine is not correct, what good is with your good life? It is like saying that, uh, you know, <coughs> the, the train is in a very good shape, but the rails are in bad shapes. So the train will go, you know, it will have a, an accident. And so, you know, we need both, we need both. So the general decay happened to the church, begin the same tendency, you know, begin to see the decay in the monasteries. This time also there was one nobleman, one nobleman. He was the Duke of Aquitaine. He was so sick and tired with these evils in the monasteries, so he founded a different type of monastery. It is called Cluny, C-L-U-N-Y. <coughs> his name was, he was, uh, 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 you know, Akutain. He was the Duke of Akutain. That was his name. He may have had another name, but he was known as the Duke of Akutain. You know, he was not a priest or anything. He was just a noble man. And he was a godly man, you know. From some perspective, he was a godly man. He had seen these monasteries and what these monks and nuns were doing there and what sort of life they are. And he said, that's, you know, these people say they are devoted for, you know, for, for, a, for a godly life. And because they were saying that, uh, you know, in the, in the common place you cannot be spiritual. So you left everything, you went to monasteries. You're freely practicing, you know, freely practicing sin there. They don't have to fear anybody. It basically is that. They don't have to fear. In the community, they have to fear somebody. There you don't have to fear anybody. So everybody was practicing that. So he uh, founded uh, a movement called the Cluny Movement. Cluny Movement. Cluny Monasteries. He started in Eastern France in 910. In this monastery, rules of asceticism were to be followed strictly. The Cluny Movement spread far and wide to other monasteries. For the next 200 years, the great Cluny reform was powerful, so powerful, that many genuine spiritual awakening happened in the Western Church. One time, it ruled over 2,000 monastic movements, the Cluny movement. 
you know they made rules very strict very strict uh, they cannot have any there was no room for any sort of immorality if anybody was found immoral they were thrown out from there so you know uh, this duke duke of aquitaine was very powerful very powerful gregory the 7th who is a great pope known as the great you know hildebrand he came out of the cluny movement there were some good popes speaking from their perspective some good popes came out of the cluny movement <clears throat> there was a great effort during this time uh, to free the church from the hands of uh, the evil rulers whether it was pope whether it was bishops whether it was noblemen they were all controlling the church and these men were basically bad people very bad people so there was enough for the cluny people wanted the church to be liberated from the hands of these evil people evil people so you know they they made rules and they tried to infiltrate into every aspect of the religious life you know we need to note that the church in rome played a great part in church history you know because it's the most important church also papacy was a gradual growth from elders to bishops to archbishops to pope it was not just in one moment no it was a gradual and also by the middle of the 10th 11th centuries papacy is totally corrupted and is brought to bondage to state state was now controlling actually kings were making popes nobody could be a pope without the king's support the crown of the pope will be you know placed on his head uh, by the princess so actually uh, papacy was subservient to the interest of the princess then as a reaction to low spiritual condition in the church a religious revival in the form of a monastery at cluny came into reality though the, it was a place called cluny but the whole movement was called the cluny movement you know that is purifying the monastery so what is this cluny reform the cluny reform aimed to reform first the clergy second the monks and third the papacy <laughs> so this was some their major they wanted to reform the clergy reform the monks and reform the papacy this reform really touched clergy monks and some popes many laymen also were challenged in fact the movement uh, uh, was started by a layman the duke of you know aquitaine he was not a clergy or he was not a monk he was Uh, just uh, you know he was a duke he was a ruler but he was a layman you know as far as religion was concerned so papacy was so corrupt that at one time they had three popes i mentioned you know and one of them selling papacy and the other buying the papacy the cluny movement wanted to put an end to these evils so they sought the help of henry the 3rd who was the emperor of the holy roman empire this emperor was one of the laymen who came under the influence of the cluny Uh, a reform you know he called a synod and despite dip, deposed silvester the third one of the three popes he had also compelled gregory the third to resign himself and then banished him to germany and another synod was called and it deposed benedict the ninth the third one so all three popes you know who fought for the office were now thrown out uh, and uh, so by henry the 3rd to get rid of the italian corruption in rome henry the 3rd made a german pope clement the 2nd but this pope and the next one died very soon they lived only for an year or two you know so henry then appointed his cousin bruno the bishop of uh, tool as pope leo the 9th leo the 9th was pope from 1049 to 1054 he was a strong you know supporter of the cluny movements he was very energetic and full of reform he was full of zeal and he began to work immediately and leo the 9th he is for the roman catholic church he is a good pope the first thing leo did was to make changes in the college of cardinals college of cardinals were advisers to the pope 
when leo the 9th became pope he found that the school of cardinals was you know purely a romans there was nobody other than a roman in that one all italians nobody else so these cardinals represented the royal or the noble families of italy they were there to safeguard the interest of the noble family the pope should not make any rule that will affect the noble family because whatever rule pope makes it is recommended usually by the school of cardinals so these cardinals were there so these cardinals represented the royals and nobles and they controlled and corrupted papacy to their interest and they were not sympathetic to the cluny movement because these cardinals knew that the cluny movement if you know get a chance they will get rid of them so the new pope appointed cardinals who supported the cluny reforms he chose cardinals from various parts of the country actually now <clears throat> he appointed cardinals from every part of the roman empire therefore the, the school of cardinals is not only italians there were italians and uh, you know there were uh, from france and germany and from you know ireland and from all uh, parts of the world he traveled all over the western europe <laughs> western roman empire and held synods he enforced the cluny reforms and maintained loyalty to hugo the founder of the cluny movement he emphasized five things no marriage for priest no sodomy no buying of office no church office without the approval of the clergy and the people the cardinals alone cannot create you know the people have to out and approve it <laughs> you know so he has brought in some very important important morally you know the 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 um, priest and uh, the popes and they were all known for sodomy you know they were you know basically even homosexuals basically they were you know and that's a problem even now it plagues from time to time you know you hear about things here and there only we here in, in the tip of the iceberg you know we don't hear but this problem is not started here or there when you prohibit marriage something will happen something or other so <clears throat> leo was a powerful pope and uh, he has made these rules and uh, and uh, it helped a whole lot so we take a break with that uh, right there